Sunday school, church service, Sunday morning services. Where does it all come from? That is the question we will be tackling today. And my goal with this video today is to educate you and show you the hidden history of the church as well as the true origin of the church so that you can see exactly where it comes from. Now, mind you, this is not to guilt trip anyone or attack anyone or any denomination. It is to show you the real hidden history and to show you the truth of the church and where it really comes from and where such a practice comes from because remember so much has been hidden from you and so much has been deliberately twisted and hidden from you on purpose and so we're tackling all this and more to come but what if i told you that the word church when properly translated does not mean what the scripture is talking about what if i told you that none of the prophets nor the messiah nor did the disciples attend or go to any church on sunday during the time of the biblical prophets and what if i told you that there is no commandment or nowhere in scripture does it state to go to church on sunday and what if I told you that the word Sunday itself is found nowhere in scripture? So are we to believe tradition or are we to believe truth? The truth will be revealed today. As you will see, the word church is found nowhere in scripture for what it means today. And in fact, the word Sunday is found nowhere in scripture at all. But when you properly translate the word church in the Hebrew, you get the word kahal, which means assembly, which also means assembly, convocation, or congregation. And when you properly translate it in the Greek, you get the word ecclesia, which simply means assembly, but nowhere does that mean in today's terms of church or going to church on Sunday. So the question we need to be asking ourselves, historically speaking, where does the word church come from? When you understand the etymology behind things and when you understand the meaning behind words and what words really mean and where words specifically come from, then you start to understand the bigger agenda behind things and how so much has been hidden from you and how you have not been told this history, but rather it has been hidden from you deliberately. So here we are at Online Etymology Dictionary and it says church, which is a noun. It comes from the Old English Circe or Circe, which means church, public place of worship, Christians collectively, from Proto-Germanic Kirika, or Cognates, Old Saxon Kirika, Old Norse Kirja, or Old Frisian Zerki, or Middle Dutch Kirki, Dutch Kirk, Old High German Kiria, or German Kircha, probably a note, C note in OED, from Greek Kiriki, which means Lord's house from Curios or ruler or Lord. And it's interesting because if you look at the word Lord in Hebrew, it means Baal. So let's keep going. Root, Kiwi, or to swell, or swollen, hence strong or powerful. It says Greek Kyrikon of the Lord was, was used of houses of Christian worship since circa 300, especially in the East, around the same time as what? the Council of Nicene and the Nicene Creed, as well as Pope Constantine, though it was less common in this sense than Ecclesia or Basilica, an example of the direct Greek to Germanic progress of many Christian words via the Goths, it was probably used by West Germanic people in their pre-Christian period. It was also picked up by Slavic, probably the Germanic, Old Church Slavonic Kirki, or Russian Surkov, or Finnish Kirko, or Estonian Kirik, are from Scandinavian, and I do apologize if I'm butchering those words. Romance in Celtic languages use variants of Latin ecclesia, such as French eglise from the 11th century. Church bell was of late Old English. Church gore is from the 18, 1680s, and church key is early 14th century. Slang used for can of bottle opener is by 1954, probably originally U.S. college student slang church mouse, and it says church verb to bring or lead to church from mid 14th century. But as you can see, the bigger agenda is where it comes from Old English, Circe. Where else have I heard that word? You're about to see in just a second. 
Now, when we do some more digging and when we do some more digging behind these words and behind the etymology of words and the history behind words and the history behind Circe, you get Kirky, which is what? It was a goddess pharmakia, witch or sorceress, who lived with her nymph attendants on the mythical island of Aya. So where does the word church comes from? It comes from the Greek Circe, which, is, which was what? A Greek goddess or a Greek pagan deity. So we see the word comes from pagan tradition and it's also no surprise that the word Circe sounds just like the word circus very interesting and suspicious indeed but it goes on to say from the encyclopedia that Circe was a mythical sorceress whom Homer calls a fair lot goddess a daughter of Helios by the Oceanid Percy a sister of Aetes she lived in the island of Aea and when Odysseus on his wanderings came to her island, Circe, after having changed several of his companions into pigs, became so much attached to the unfortunate hero that he was induced to remain a whole year with her. So what? It comes from Circe, a daughter of Helios. That's where the word church comes from, a daughter of the sun god. Why is that so important? And why do you need to keep that in mind? You're about to see the pagan origins of the church to come. Like I said, when you start to understand the language behind words and where words really come from and the etymology of words, then you start to understand the real deeper meaning behind words and behind traditions and where exactly they are coming from and where scripture tells us to do and what tradition tells us to do. Now I'm here in Psalm or Tehalim chapter 68 and why I'm here is because this chapter right here in the scripture in the King James Version tells us the name of our father why is this so important is because in order to worship our father we should know his name shouldn't we and because scripture was written in Hebrew wouldn't it make sense that he has a Hebrew name is that just me let's keep going but it even tells us what his name is in the King James Version verse 4 it says sing unto what you may call God or in the Hebrew that's Elohim another way to pronounce that is Elohim sing praises to his name extol him that rideth upon the heavens by his name Yah and rejoice before him so Yah or Yahuwah and because this channel is a truth network it is to show you the real truth and to restore the set apart Hebrew names for our creator Yahuwah and his true son Yahusha, because even scripture says in Yahukanan or John chapter 5 verses 43 that the Messiah himself even says that he comes in his father's name. Well, what's his father's name? Well, Psalm chapter 68 verses 4 tells us what his father's name is, Yah or it's pronounced J-A-H, or Y-A-H, Yah, Yahuwah, that is his name. We are to rejoice before him. We are to even sing praises to his name, which is Yah, or Yahuwah, which is where you get the word hallelujah from, which means in the Hebrew, praise be unto Yah, or Yahuwah. So when you go to church on Sunday and you're worshiping Lord God, are you really worshiping the Father by his name? That is the question you you should be thinking about remember nothing new is under the sun they were worshiping on Sunday back then thousands and thousands of years ago even before the Messiah but the question is the question is who were they worshiping what were they worshiping and just what were they doing on Sunday now that we have gone over some of the history of the word church and I've just proven to you with scripture itself in the King James Version the name of our father Yahuwah or Yah and that we are to sing praises to his name Yah according to scripture itself let's see if scripture itself identifies and tells us if we are to go to church on Sunday because I know we have all seen the Ten Commandments and we're all familiar with the Ten Commandments that are spoken of in Shamut or Exodus chapter 20, the, the fourth of which says, Thou shalt honor and keep the Shabbat or the Sabbath day. Well, the Sabbath day is the day of rest, is the seventh day. Well, we're going to see exactly how that has been changed, twisted, and altered in history and, and just who is responsible for it. So I'm here at the actual Vatican's website and I'm here at the Catechism 
of the Catholic Church because what you're about to see is that the Roman Catholic Church has changed so much. And one of the things that they changed is the fourth commandment and they call it the third commandment according to them, which is to what? Remember the Sabbath day to keep it set apart. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to Yahuwah, your Allahim. In it you shall do no work. But what has the Catholic Church done? Let's go all the way down to 2190, where it says, and even proves on the Roman Catholic website itself, what they have done. It says, the Sabbath, which represented the completion of the first creation, has been replaced by Sunday, which recalls the new creation inaugurated by the resurrection of Christ. So as you can see, what has the Catholic Church done? They even tell you what they've done. They replaced it with Sunday. So instead of the Shabbat or the Sabbath being on Saturday or the seventh day, they replaced it to make Sunday to be the new so-called Sabbath. That is what they've done. And they say, and many people say, oh, well, because that's because the Messiah was resurrected on Easter Sunday. So therefore the new Sabbath is on Sunday. The question is, was he really resurrected on Sunday or is that something that has been a tradition spread by the Roman Catholic Church? That is a question we will tackle to come. When you understand the history behind everything, then you start to understand exactly what has happened and exactly what has been done. Because here I am at, the, again, the Catechism of the Catholic Church, and it says the Ten Commandments. And I'm here at the Ten Commandments. And as you see from the Ten Commandments, one of the commandments is completely missing altogether. Now, this is the, Catholic, the, uh, the commandments that the C Catholicism follows. As you can see, it follows, okay, you shall have no strange Elohim or gods before Yahuwah. You shall not take the name of Yahuwah in vain, even though using Lord and God does take his name in vain, because I've just proven to you with scripture itself what his name is. And it says, remember to keep the keep set apart or holy, what they consider the Lord's day. Well, scripture doesn't even say that. It says the Sabbath day. So they changed not only took out Sabbath, but they took out the Sabbath day and they replaced it with the Lord's day. It goes on to say, honor your father and your mother. You shall not kill. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife and you shall not covet your neighbor's goods. However, there's one commandment missing from here, which is what? No graven images. Where's that commandment? I don't even see it on here. What is really going on here? Remember, the goal that we're trying to do today is we're trying to figure out the origin of the church and where the church really comes from. But to find that out, we must first go to the Roman Catholic Church and we must first go to history itself to see exactly where it really comes from. So now I'm going to be taking you to some creeds that talk about what happened and how they instituted Sunday sun worship all over again back as early as 325 AD from Pope Constantine. And we're here at back again at the Vatican's website and we're here at the Catechism of the Catholic Church. And we're here gonna be talking about the Nicene Creed, which is what? The profession of the Christian faith. But the question is, does this match what scripture tells us? Because if not, then there is a big problem. Now I know I could go, I could go all day with the Nicene Creed and talk about the problems with it, but what I wanna focus on today mainly is right here where it says for our sake he and the he it's talking about is the messiah the hebrew name of our messiah is yahusha not jc but it goes on to say he was crucified under pontius pilate he suffered died and was buried on the third day he rose again in fulfillment of the scriptures he ascended into heaven and is seated on the right hand of the father now this is according to the nicene creed this is not according to me and it goes on to say he will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end okay that sounds good doesn't it but it says right here on the third day he rose again in fulfillment of the scripture and the question is was he really rose again on sunday which is where you get the sun worship in the church or was he actually risen on the shabbat then that is the question we need to be focusing on and of course it goes on to say we believe in one holy catholic and apostolic church and everything like that but is it really according to scripture is the question we should be asking ourselves because just like i said earlier nowhere in the scripture will you find 
time does it say that thou shalt go to church on Sunday? Nowhere will you find that. So somebody is changing everything. Somebody is lying to you. Who exactly is lying to you? We're about to find that out in just a minute. All throughout scripture, we are told to keep the Shabbat. We are told to honor and keep the Sabbath day, the seventh day of rest. Now, I know some of you are out there are still going to say, oh, but it's okay to worship on Sunday. But the question is, who are you worshiping? Because if you're not singing praises to the name of Yah or Yahuwah and singing praises to his name, well, then you're not worshiping him according to scripture. Not only that, but yes, we're supposed to worship Yahuwah every single day. But the question is, are you worshiping Yahuwah? when you go to church on Sunday if you're not even using his name but you're using pagan titles of Baal such as Lord and God that is the question we need to be asking ourselves now I'm here at Sabbath truth and I'm going to be reading this with you it says the Roman Emperor Constantine a former sun worshiper professed conversion to Christianity though his subsequent actions suggest the conversion was more of a political move than a genuine heart change Constantine named himself Bishop of the Catholic Church and enacted the first civil law regarding Sunday observance in AD 321 and this is what he actually said or was actually written on the venerable day of the sun let the magistrate and people residing in cities rest and let all wor workshops be closed in the country however persons engaged in agricultural work may freely and lawfully continue their pursuits because it often happens that another day is not so suitable for grain growing or for vine planting lest by by neglecting the proper moment for such operations, the bounty of heaven should be lost. And this is from Shaft's History of the Christian Church, Volume 3, Chapter 75. Note that Constantine's law did not even mention Sabbath but referred to the mandated rest day as the venerable day of the sun, and how kind he was to allow the people to observe it as it was the covenant. Contrast this with Yahuwah's command to observe the Sabbath even during the plowing season and harvest according to Shamut or Exodus chapter 34 verses 21, which is the Torah, by the way. But it goes on to say, perhaps the church leaders noticed this laxity as well. And just four years later in AD 325, Pope Sylvester officially named Sunday the Lord's Day, which we just talked about from the Catholic's website, the Roman Catholic Church uh, Vatican website. And in AD 338, Eusebius, the court bishop of Constantine, wrote all things whatsoever that it was the duty to do on the Sabbath, the seventh day of the week, we, as in Constantine, Eusebius, and other bishops, have transferred to the Lord's Day, the first day of the week, as more appropriately belonging to it. And when you look up the word Lord in Hebrew, you get what? Baal. I'm not making this stuff up. Do your own research and come to your own conclusions. But I'm telling you, it's all about history and where it comes from. And what you start to see is that so much has been changed because it says, what venerable day of the sun. And there are many people out there that are saying, oh, that the you know Sunday sun worship, there's going to be a mandatory Sunday law that's going to be followed. Hello, that law has been established for nearly 1,700 years now. So what that's telling you, and it's also going on today, and what it's telling you is that this has been going on for a long, long time now. Not only that, but we see this law being effect in today when you see a bunch of stores being closed on Sunday and observing so-called the Lord's Day rather than observing the Shabbat because the Catholic Church made the change. I'm telling you, real history is being uncovered and the truth is being revealed today. Now there's one more creed I would like to go over with you that has been done in history and it's called the Creed or the Council of Laodicea and this is the council where Sunday sun worship became instituted throughout the churches in the 4th century AD around the year AD circa 364 AD. Now it's interesting because when you read through these canons they tell you exactly the laws that have been changed and laws that have been made by man just like Revelation tells us that the beast would think to change times and laws. Well, that's exactly what happened with the Roman Catholic Church, not only changing the Shabbat or the Sabbath from the seventh day and making it Sunday, but also taking out the commandment of no graven images, replacing it with an extra commandment that we just read about back from the catechism, but also enforcing Sunday sun worship throughout the canons and throughout their own laws, that laws that make no effect of the laws of the Torah, of the laws of scripture that the 
the Messiah himself has talked about in the book of Matthew chapter 15. And you can also look at my scriptures often ignored this week for more on that. But I just wanted to uh, briefly go over with you the Council of Laodicea and how everything has been changed. Now, I'm going to go over some of the canons at this council that was done and that was also talked about that was in force that also talked about Sunday sun worship and where exactly this comes from. Here are some of the canons and the laws that were enforced during this time, but I want to turn your attention to two canons that I think are very interesting, and they are Canon 16 and Canon 29. Now, like I said, you can read this on your own time, but what you even start to see is that they made up rules for the church, and you can even see in Canon 9, 10, and 11 the rules that had to be made up for the church itself. And it even says in Canon 9 that members of the church are not allowed to meet in the cemeteries nor attend the so-called martyries of any heretics for prayer or service, but such as do so if they be communicants shall be excommunicated for a time, but if they repent and confess that they have sinned, they shall be received. Now, why am I even going over this is because these are laws that man have made up and have nothing to do with the laws of the Torah and the laws of the commandments that we're supposed to be following if we say we're righteous. But Canon 16 says the Gospels are to be read on the Sabbath, i.e. Saturday, with the other scriptures. So the question is, okay, if they're to be read on the Shabbat or the Sabbath, then why is church on Sunday and not the uh, not the Shabbat as well? That's the first question. But now let's go to Canon 29 and see what that canon says as well. As you can see, so much has been twisted. Man's laws and man's rules has been twisted and subverted. And not only that, but throughout history, man's laws has subverted you from the truth. And today, my goal is to give you real, authentic truth. Now, I'm here at Canon 29, and it says, Christians must not Judaize by resting on the Sabbath, but must work on that day, rather honoring the Lord's day. And if they can, resting then as Christians. But if any shall be found to be Judaizers, let them be anathema from Christ. So as you see, what, what do they try to do? What did the Catholic Church try to do through the Council of Laodicea? They tried to demonize anybody who kept the Torah. They tried to demonize anybody who kept the real Shabbat or the real Sabbath day, which is the seventh day because they wanted to blend paganisms with their new religion called Christianity. And how did they do that? By making it in a law to work on the Shabbat and to go to church and rest on sun day or sun worship which is what the venerable day of the sun according to pope constantine and they try to do that by saying by judaizing by resting on the sabbath no we have to get that straight too that the messiah and all the prophets they were not jewish that religion did not exist at that time the letter j did not exist at that time so therefore they were not jewish they were hebrew people and they observed the law statutes and commandments of yahuwah one of which says keeping the sabbath that's one of the ten commandments but we see that this canon right here breaks it not only that but these canons also what do they do heretics they also bring in these heresies and that is how they were able they is in the catholic church that is how the inquisition got hold and that is how the inquisition got rule and that is why you see much of what you see today and that is why there's so much confusion because people are trying to find well what's the real truth remember let yahuwah and let the word of yahuwah be the truth and let every man be a lie Real quick, I would like to go over the resurrection with you because this relates quite well to Sunday sun worship. And like I said, many try to use the and justify the tradition that the Messiah was resurrected on a Sunday. And that's why we are to go to a church and worship on Sunday. But the question is, was he really resurrected on a Sunday? Because if not, then somebody is lying to you. And I'm here at the Church of the Great God or CGG. And it even tells you, you can read this study on your own time time that the resurrection was not on Sunday. And that is correct. And it even says tradition, no proof. It is a tradition that it's, can you really have three days and three nights between Good Friday and Sunrise Easter Sunday? There's not three days between there. So therefore, it's not true. The Messiah was resurrected on the Shabbat. The Messiah, Yahusha, he even says that he is the master of the Shabbat. So therefore, it would only make sense that he was resurrected 
expected on the Shabbat, on the seventh day. Not only that, but all throughout scripture, both the Old and the New Testament, we see the Shabbat all over the place. We see that the Messiah even honored the Shabbat and kept the Shabbat and told his disciples to keep the Shabbat. So where is all this Sunday sun worship coming from? Where does it all stem from is the question. Where does all of this stem from and what is the truth behind Sunday sun worship and is really is anything new under the sun? Because what you're about to find out is nothing is new under the sun. Remember, the question you should be thinking about is why do you do the things that you do? Why do you celebrate certain things that you celebrate? Why do you even celebrate certain so-called holidays or holidays that you celebrate? Why? Is it because of tradition? Is it because of what your parents used to do? Is it because of what your grandparents used to do? Is it because of a tradition that has been passed on and carried on from the generations upon generations of what your family used to do? And that's why you do it. But the question you should be thinking about is if you're really looking and searching for truth out there is is it something that is pleasing to our father and his name is Yahuwah or Yah as I have proven in the book of Psalms so that's something we should be thinking about not only that but we should also be thinking about well what is the history behind what I'm doing because like I said it goes much deeper than you think but here I am at the Britannica Encyclopedia and it talks about Mithraism which was a Persian religion and it says Mithraism or the worship of Mithra or Mithras, the Iranian god of the sun. And I just talked about earlier how Circe, the word which means church today, comes from what? Circe, the daughter of Heliopolis, the sun god. But let's keep going. The Iranian god of the sun, Justice, contract and war in the pre-Zoroastrian Iran, known as Mithras in the Roman Empire during the 2nd and 3rd centuries AD. This deity was honored as the patron of loyalty to the emperor. After the acceptance of Christianity by the Emperor Constantine in the early 4th century, Mithraism rapidly declined. So this was the religion that was worshipped well before Christianity even became a thing. Now let's go into the history. Before Zoroaster or 6th century BC or earlier, the Iranians had a polytheistic religion and Mithra was the most important of their gods, kind of like Hinduism. First of all, he was the god of contract and mutual obligation. In a cuneiform tablet of the 15th century BC that contains a treaty between the Hittites and the Mitanni, Mithra is invoked as the god of oath. Furthermore, in some Indian Vedic texts of the god Mitra, or the Indian form of Mithra, appears both as a friend and as contract. The word Mitra may be translated in either way because contracts and mutual obligation make friends. In short, Mithra may signify any kind of communication between men and whatever establishes good relations between them. Mithra was called what? The mediator. Where else have I heard that with JC? Mithra was also what? God of the sun, the venerable day of the sun, just as indicated from the Pope in 321 AD. Is it all starting to make sense? Are you seeing where all of this comes from? I hope so. But it says of the shining light that beholds everything and hence was evoked in oaths. The Greeks and Romans considered Mithra as a sun god and the commandments in the Torah also speak about how you are not to take any oaths to any other deities or gods except to Yahuwah. Well, taking oaths to Mithra, the sun god, is breaking commandments. Then it goes on to say he was probably also the god of kings. He was the god of mutual obligation between the king and his warriors, and hence the god of war. Just like who? The destruction god Shiva. Is it all making sense now? He was also the god of justice, which was guaranteed by the king. Whenever men observed justice in contract, they venerated Mithra. And it was what? The sacrifice of the bull. And it began with Darius in 522 to 486 BC. So this began 500 years before there even was a Messiah. They were worshiping sun gods thousands and thousands and thousands of years before there even was a religion called Christianity to begin with, before the Messiah, Yahusha, was even on the scene. And I hope you're seeing that. And I hope you're seeing that what day were they worshiping these sun gods? On Sunday, that was the day to do it, to honor and worship the sun. Oh, but it's not just Mithraism. It's also in Egyptian religion with Horus. It's also in Babylonian religion with Nimrod himself and Tammuz, which is where you get that lovely cross from. 
that's where all of this stems from. It stems all the way back to paganism. It stems all the way back to ancient uh, mystery Babylonian religion, ancient Egyptian religion. It stems all the way back all the way. And I hope you're seeing that all of this was done thousands and thousands and thousands of years ago. But if you still don't believe me, I'm about to show you some real proof and evidence that even the Roman Catholic Church has symbolisms that evoke quite well of paganisms. Don't believe me? You're about to find out in just a minute. Remember, are we to believe the traditions of man or are we to believe scripture and the word of Yahuwah itself? And now here I am at the origin of sun worship, Trinity, Babylon, and Sunday sun worship, which includes going to church on Sunday. But it goes on to say Satan's church had its beginning at Babylon with the construction of the Tower of Babel on the plain of Shinar by the river Euphrates many generations after the deluge. At the time of the construction of Babylon at the Tower of Babel in Barashith or Genesis chapter 11 verses 1 through 4, mankind had multiplied and spoken one language. Cush, who was the son of Ham and grandson of Noah, according to Barashith or Genesis chapter 10, verses 1 and 6 helped to plan with his son Nimrod a blueprint by which to rule the world of humanity through a wicked counterfeit religion. Nimrod was the originator of sun worship and founder of Babylon. Let me just repeat that and highlight that for all of you. Nimrod was the originator of sun worship and founder of Babylon. Not only Babylon, but Freemasonry. And in the Freemasonic religion, Bab Nimrod is considered the first Freemason. But let's keep going. A Bible translation called the Targum says, Nimrod became a mighty man of sin, a murderer of innocent men, and a rebel before Yahuwah. Now, the beginning of Nimrod's evil plan had its origin at Babel, which was later known as Babylon. And this was Satan's attempt to defy Yahuwah and his authority, and the ringleader of his scheme was Nimrod. Nimrod had a plan to weld together and strengthen the evil religious system, so he married his own mother, who was Semiramis. She was the first de deified queen of Babylon, and Nimrod was the first deified king. Semiramis was as wicked as her son Nimrod, and as much sold out to Satan and devil worship as did he. So as you see, nothing new is under the sun. This stuff was going on 4,000 years ago. And what was Satan's plan? Develop a counterfeit opposition system of religion to attract worship away from the true Allahim or God of heaven who is Yahuwah. And what was his plan to do that? Through worshiping on Sunday. A counterfeit holy day, or as I call it, heli day, was instituted in honor of the sun god Sunday, which is where that word comes from. And this was designed by Satan to rob Yahuwah of his peculiar authority as the creator of the universe as designated by his set-apart day, the Shabbat, or the Sabbath day, which is the seventh day, but on the counterfeit Sabbath, which is on Sunday, which is when you go to church and worship Lord God, you don't even know it, but you're actually worshiping what? The paganisms and pagan titles of Baal on Sunday. And I hope you're seeing that with both your eyes open. The article then goes on to talk about the Trinity and where it got its start. And if you would like, you can watch my video, The Pagan Origins of the Trinity. And you can see it says the Trinity got its start in ancient Babylon with Nimrod, Tammuz, and Semiramis. Now, who is Tammuz? Tammuz is the son of Nimrod and the son of Semiramis, which is also where you get the cross from because no, our Messiah was not nailed to the cross. He was hung on a tree. You can read about that in Acts chapter 5, verses 30, Acts chapter 10, verses 39. Acts chapter 13 verses 29, 1 Peter chapter 2 verses 24, as well as Galatians chapter 3 verses 13 through 14. So where does the cross come from then if scripture itself says that the Messiah was hung on a tree? Then it goes on to say, Semiramis demanded worship for both her husband and her son, as well as herself. She claimed that her son was both the father and the son. Yes, he was God the father and God the son, the first divine and comprehensible trinity. And this is from Alexander Hipslops, The Two Babylons, page 51. 
one. So as you can see, the, the, what did they do? Semiramis and Nimrod, they proclaimed themselves to be gods. And that's how all of this, the Trinity and all of these pagan hella days, such as Easter and all of that were in force. Not only that, but it says Semiramis and her priestess Satan were deep into the occult, magic and illusion. They were masters of lies and deception. Everywhere there are statues or idols of this mother child cult. And you see that embedded in all religions. And, and what? Baal, the sun god, and Semiramis, the queen mother of heaven, which is also talked about in the book of Yarm Yahu or Jeremiah chapter 44 as well. So you see it there that that our creator Yahuwah does not like it, nor does he ha have anything to do with this worship or Sunday sun worship, nor does he have anything to do or want any part in that, or nor does he want his people taking part in these things. And I hope you're seeing that because it says her symbol became the moon and her husband Nimrod was called Baal, which means Lord, by the way, the sun God, and his symbol became the sun. The city of Babylon was the seat of Satan worship until its fall to the Medes and the Persians in 539 BC. And I hope you're seeing that with both your eyes open. And that statue that you see all over the place with the mother and the son, you see it, not only do you see it with Mary and so-called Jesus, but it comes from who? Horus and Isis, Semiramis and Tammuz. That's where you see it all over the place. And you also see it in ancient Indian religions too, with who? Devaki and Buddha, as well as Maya and Krishna. I'm not making this stuff up. But it goes on to say, church historian Socrates Scaladius, uh, fifth century, wrote, for although almost all churches throughout the world celebrate the sacred mysteries of the Lord's Supper on the Sabbath of every week, yet the Christians of Alexandria and at Rome on account of some ancient tradition have ceased to do this and this is according to his ecclesiastical history book 5 chapter 22 so as you see they all stopped worshiping on the shabbat and worshiped on sunday or or sun because they were worshiping the sun god and it goes on to say in phoenicia semiramis and nimrod were worshiped or as known as ashtaroth and tammuz in greece aphrodite and eros in rome venus and cupid and in china mother Shing Mu and her child. In Egypt, Semiramis became known as Isis, the queen of heaven, as well as Nimrod becoming known as Osiris and frequently called Horus. But oh, we see it in Persia as well with who? Mithras. Now it's all making sense, isn't it? And we also see December 25th, the birth of Tammuz, because December 25th, Christmas, has nothing to do with the birth of our Messiah. Our Messiah was born sometime in the fall, around the fall feast days. That's when our Messiah was born. So where is this December 25th coming from? Not only that, but also where is this Easter coming from? Because like I said, the Messiah was not resurrected on Easter Sunday. He was resurrected on the Shabbat. So where are we getting Easter Sunday from? We're getting it from the weeping of Tammuz and the worship of Tammuz, as well as where you get the cross from. It goes on to say it has often been charged that Catholicism is overlaid with many pagan encrustations. Catholicism is ready to accept that accusation and even to make it her boast. The great god Pan is not really dead. He is baptized. Who is Pan? The sun god Satan himself. Wake up. This is from the story of Catholicism, page 37. I hope you're seeing this with both your eyes open. Then it goes on to say that as time elapsed, stories spread worldwide about Semiramis and Nimrod as Baal worship was everywhere. The above information on the beginning of Satan's church and its unscriptural practices is found in the two Babylons by Alexander Hislop, and I highly recommend you read that book. In his book, he has composed a list of names adopted in other parts of the world that can be traced back to Semiramis and Nimrod in one way or another. The list of names are as follows, and we see Semiramis right here. We see her name, what? Cybele or the goddess mother Asia, Fortuna in pagan Rome, Isis, the queen mother of heaven in Egypt, or Isi in India, Venus of Rome, Ashtaroth in Phoenicia, Aphrodite in Greece, Irene of Greece, Ishtar, Babylon, Rhea, mother of gods, Diana, Ephesian, and Xing Mu, the so-called holy mother of China. Now we also see Nimrod, we see Dioeus or Asia, the boy Jupiter in Rome, Osiris or Horus in Egypt, Iswara in India, Cupid in Rome, Tammuz in Phoenicia, 
Eros in Greece, the boy Plutus in Greece, the winged one in Babylon, Orion, the constellation, Bacchus of Greece, and the centaur of Greece, not to mention Mithras and Zoroaster as well. Satan pulled it off well, and he had, done, had the whole world trapped into some form of Baal worship. And the question that you should be wondering is, is this going on today just like it was going on back then? Is it going on today in churches? Is it going on at your Sunday sun worship church where you're worshiping the pagan title of Baal, also known as Lord, and the Canaanite deity Gad, also known as God? Nothing new is under the sun. This is why language is so important. This is why history is so important. Do not be fooled by the ways of man and by the ways of tradition, but rather see the truth for what it really is. The article then goes on to talk about sun worship as well as the Queen Mother of Heaven, and it also talks about some of the councils that we already talked about, as well as the Council, the Nicene Council, as well as the Council of Laodicea. And like I said, here's that image right here of what Horus and Isis, where it stems from, and you see it today with Mary and Jesus when the commandments specifically say no graven images, so why is that there? That should always be the question. Is it there because of tradition? What has the Roman Catholic Church done? The first beast that we can identify in Revelation chapter 13. How deep does this go? But it also goes on to say the above information can be found in the books The Two Babylons by Alexander Hislop and The Angel of Light by Jack Chick. Now, Hislop also traces Roman Catholic sacraments, ceremonies, doctrines, confessionals, priesthoods, all the way back to ancient Babylonian Baal worship. Roman Catholicism is based on ancient Babylonian Baal worship and on the man-made traditions of the church fathers, which I've just proven with all of the creeds that have been done in history. If you still don't believe me, oh, you're about to believe it in just a second with both your eyes open. As you can see, here are a sample of pictures showing the link between Babylonian paganism and the Roman Catholic religion. And wow, nothing new is under the sun. Thousands and thousands and thousands of years later, and nothing has changed. And I hope you're seeing that. As you can see, the Dagon priest with the fish hat. And by the way, Dagon was a fish god, a fish deity. Wow, the Pope is also wearing the same fish hat, no different. So the Catholic Popes wear the same style hat as the old pagan priest who worshiped the fish god Dagon, no different. And we know that the cross has nothing to do with the resurrection of our Messiah, but everything to do with the worship of Tammuz, as I've just proven in some of my other videos as well, Dagon the fish god. Let's keep going. A symbol of Shamash, the sun god, and we see the Shamash symbol on Pope John Paul II, Mitter, on his Mitter hat as well, as well as the cross of Tammuz. Let's keep going. We see the solar wheel at the Vatican, Again, the symbol of the sun god, sun god symbol seen here with Pope Francis right there. So we see exactly where it comes from. We also see the sun god Apollo on a temple at the Pergamon Museum right there, one of the many sun symbols found at the Vatican. Why do you think they have all those sun symbols at the Vatican? Have you ever thought and stopped and questioned yourself and wondered why that's the case? Have you ever done those things? A statue of a woman dearly holding the same sun symbol right there at the Vatican. Then we go on to Babylonian sun worship right here. And then we see Roman Catholic moon strands. The round wafer is held in where? A crescent moon. We also see that with the Islamic temple. We also see that with Egyptian artifacts that the sun disk is in the crescent moon, as well as the Roman Catholic altar with Mary, which is a which is what? A graven image and the sun disk inside a crescent moon. And we also see Apsis bull, probably the image that the uh, Yahudi made in gold at Mount Sinai. Notice the sun disk, which is right there, which you see in a ton of Egyptian pictures, uh, and the crescent moon horns right there, which is something you also see in ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics. Let's keep going. An obelisk at the temple uh, in Egypt right there, which also represents the phallic symbolism of Nimrod, by the way, his private part. And here's the obelisk at the Vatican with the giant cross on top of it. Interesting. Now, this is what I want to show you too. Pagan goddess Isis 
with Horus the child. Notice the sun disk above her head. So here's Isis right here and here's Horus right there. Notice the sun disk. Roman Catholic Mary with child, supposedly so-called Jesus. Again, notice the sun disk of both above their heads in the pagan world that denotes sun worship on sun day are you starting to see the connection i hope so because what does the commandments tell us to do to honor the shabbat and worship yahuwah not partake in sun worship so i hope you're seeing this with both eyes open Oh, but it keeps going because as you can see, the above diagram of the Catholic altar shows the same Babylonian sun symbol. And remember, the question is why all these symbols to begin with? And here's a picture of the Christmas Eve mask at the Vatican from 1996. You see the same sun symbol, the symbol of Baal. And the photo below behind Pope John Paul II on front of the altar of St. Peter's Basilica, you see a tapestry with the sunburst design nearly identical to the pagan sun god symbol of Baal or Shaman which we just talked about earlier. The tapestry is called the Altar Frontal Antipendium of or Pallium Altaris. What are you seeing? Sun worship and sun symbols all over the place to represent the sun god Shamash. And you see it all over the place embedded within, within the Roman Catholic Church, within the Vatican. And I hope you're seeing the very, very, very similar uh, and similarities between them. As you can see below on the left is a Neo-Assyrian standing stone dating from about 824 to 811 BC, which depicts King Shamshi Adad V. In particular, note the necklace the king is wearing, which is right here. You see that cross right there. Wow, they you mean to tell me they had the cross 800 years before the Messiah? What is that telling you? On it is what's called the cross petit. 2,800 years ago, that shape was symbolic of pagan sun worship. So you can click it for a closer look. And look who's wearing it 2,800 years later. Nothing has changed. And I hope you're noticing that with both your eyes open. It's the same thing. It's the same paganisms all over again. And we can see a medallion from the Vatican, which used to represent sun worship worship and we also see that eucharistic water from catholic mass also has the same thing but like i said this is in catholicism but if you don't think that this is going on in christian churches with sunday sun worship and worshiping lord god on sunday oh think again because whether or not you want to believe it or not that what all christian churches stem from rome all Christian churches that you see today stem from the Roman Catholic Church. So whether you want to believe it or not, when you say that you're Christian, you are also Catholic, whether you want to believe that or not. And I hope you're seeing that with both your eyes open. Like I said, I'm trying to expose history to you in a truth perspective. We don't do this out of hate for people of the Catholic Church, nor do we do this for the hate of Christians or Christianity, but we're trying to show you and expose to you the abominations that are committed and as well as the truth that has been hidden from you that has not been exposed to you until around now. Remember, the truth is coming to light, so we're exposing what goes on. And as you can see in ancient Egyptian pictures here, Here's a picture of the cross again, and here's a picture of the sun disc or sun symbol with the serpent around it. The sun god and high priest of pagan Egypt, not so different from other priests sitting on thr thrones. Notice the circle above its head. This is how you know it's the sun god, and it keeps going on. Oh, we see the sun here in Roman Catholic churches today with the Roman Catholic Pope sitting on the papal throne at the Vatican. Notice the great sun emblem above the throne. Notice how the Pope has a Eucharist that is worship. Notice the sun rays to honor sun worship. Notice Pope Francis holding his head at the Catholic monstrance, which contains the Eucharist that is worship. Notice how it looks like a giant sun and worshiping it on sun day. And I hope you're seeing that. Notice how the Roman Catholic sun worship containing the Eucharist once again, notice the same image of the sun as above the Egyptian sun worship where it comes from. Very interesting and suspicious indeed. And it goes on to show more sun symbolisms as well in the sun worship that goes on with it. The symbol of Baal all over with the crosses, the symbol of Tammuz that we just gone over earlier. A picture of the Greek sun god Apollo on the temple of Apollo in the Pergamon Museum in Berlin. And we see it all over the place and we see the sun symbols right there and graven images as well another image of sun 
worship. The priest makes an offering to the sun god, just like today at Roman Catholic masks and in Christian churches, when you worship Lord God on Sunday, instead of worshiping Yahuwah or worshiping Yah and singing praises to his name, just as the commandments tell us, and just as Psalm chapter 68 verses 4 tell us, what exactly is going on? And so this talks about communion as well as the Eucharist that not only goes on in the Catholic Church, but also in Christian churches as well. Because it's what? Sun worship is religious devotion paid to the sun, either as a deity or as a symbol of a deity. So even the symbol of it is giving homage to sun worship. And so we're going to look at the Eucharist as well as what communion that is taken on Sunday. And is it really holy or is it really helly? Because what you're going to see is that it all stems from the IHS, which all stems from what sun worship, as I was just saying earlier. And we see it here with the crosses. We see the ancient that it was ancient embedded in ancient religions as well as ancient sun god religions. And we see it again today. Nothing new is under the sun. And like I said, we see it here in the Vatican as well. We see it up there. We see all the statues that go with sun worship. We see them all over embedded in churches, embedded in different uh, plastered in churches all over the place. You can see all the sun symbolisms and the sun worship that goes involved with this. Why do you think we see it all over in, in different Christian churches as well as Catholic churches with all the halos and everything? Why do you think that is? Why do you think that is the case? I hope you're seeing the bigger agenda. And like I said, just the act of going to church on Sunday is partaking in sun worship and even taking the Eucharist and the communion on Sunday and that little round wafer is what? Partaking in sun worship. It's a symbol of worshiping the sun, whether you want to believe that or not whether you know that or not. But like I said, we've all been deceived. I myself was a Christian for over 20 years. We have all been deceived when it comes to this stuff. But now that we know, and now that we know the truth, remember the truth is what makes you free. And like I said, what it refers to Mithraism, that is where it all stems from. What goes on in the churches today and what goes on in Catholicism today, it all stems back thousands and thousands and thousands of years ago. The pagan and the Wiccans were doing it thousands and thousands of years ago and are even doing it today just like what goes on in the church and what goes on with the sun worship in and how it crept into the Christian religion and has been blindly accepted by the masses and I hope you're seeing that with both your eyes open because it all it all stems from sun worship just like December 25th which is not the real birthday of the Messiah but the birth of Nimrod himself all in Easter which is what the resurrection of Tammuz as well as worshiping on Sunday sun worship and even going to church denotes sun worship as well when you're going to worship Lord and God and not Yahuwah when not worshiping by his name, which is what the commandments tell us, and not honoring the Shabbat, which is on the seventh day, but rather observing that on Sunday because of what the Catholic Church has reinstituted. I hope you're seeing it, and I hope you're seeing it with both eyes open. So in conclusion, what have we learned today? What have we learned about the church as well as the origins of the church and where the church really comes from? What have we learned and what are the conclusions and what conclusions can be made and drawn from today? Well, the first conclusion definitely is that we see the history of the word church and where the word church really comes from. We see that the word church is nowhere in scripture of what it means today and that the actual correct word of translation of that word is kahal or ecclesia in the Greek which means assembly or congregation. So therefore, you do not have to be in a building to be considered the church. You yourself are the church when you're gathered together with brothers and sisters of Yahusha HaMashiach, the restored name of our Messiah. That is the true church, so to speak. We also see that the word Sunday is nowhere in scripture, nor does it even say in scripture that the Messiah was resurrected on a Sunday. And as I've just proven, the Messiah, Yahusha, 
Yahusha was actually resurrected on the Shabbat. Not only that, but the commandments tell us to keep the Shabbat. And if you read in Exodus chapter 20, as well as Ezekiel chapter 20, you will see that the Shabbat or the seventh day of rest is the sign that Yahuwah our father has given us with the rest of the world to be a covenant with us. So where's all this Sunday worship in the Lord's day? Where is that coming from? Well, when you look up the word Lord in the Hebrew, the word Lord means Baal. So when it says Lord's day or when the Catholic church says the Lord's day, it might as well say Baal's day because the Lord's day was instituted when within the Nicene Creed in 321 AD by Pope Constantine with the venerable day of the sun, as well as the council of life in 364 AD, which, which mandated the church and which mandated the creation of the church to be created. But like I said, when you look at the history and just as we looked at today with Mithraism and other sun gods that were worshipped throughout history, you start to see that they were all worshipping the sun and they were all worshipped on Sunday or giving worship and homage to the sun throughout Semiramis and Nimrod. That's where it got its start. And then it trickled down into other cultures and history through the Chinese culture of Xing Mu, through the Indian culture of Krishna and Maya, through the uh, culture of Buddha and Devaki, and through Egyptian culture with Horus and Isis, as well as the Babylonian culture with who none other than Nimrod and Semiramis themselves. And I hope you're seeing that. By the way, when you look at a church itself and when you look at the phallic symbolism, we see a cross right here. Well, when let's zoom in on this. When you look at the actual cross, you see that it comes from what the cross has nothing to do with the Messiah and everything to do with the worship of Tammuz. But also this phallic symbol right here, also known as the steeple, is what the obelisk or the phallic symbol of Nimrod. And I hope you're seeing that with both eyes open. But hopefully this has taught you the pagan origins of the church and where Sunday sun worship really comes from and that we are not to be partaking in the church at all if we're of righteousness. And I hope you're seeing that with both your eyes open and I hope this will help you on your study and your journey into truth as you start to seek the creator Yahuwah and his true son Yahusha and start to come out of the paganisms known as religion and start to come into truth and see the truth for what it really is. So what is the truth then? If we see that the church comes from and originates from Sunday sun worship, then what is the truth? Well, the truth is the word of Yahuwah. And what is the word of Yahuwah? The word of our Father is that we are to worship him and call upon his name every single day. That is true. But what we are also to do is we are to what? Honor and observe the Sabbath day or the seventh day, which begins on Friday evening and goes all the way to seven, Saturday evening. You can read more about this in the book of Nehemiah as well. And what you start to see is that we are to do no work on that day. We are to, to uh, no cooking, no cleaning. We are to do all of our cooking ahead of time. And on that day is to be the set apart rest day, just as Yahuwah has given us. Because just as we see in Genesis or Barashith, Yahuwah is the one he rested on the seventh day. And he's given that day to us so that we may rest on the seventh day as well. But that is how we can honor him. We can start to follow his laws, statutes, and commandments. We can learn about his true son, Yahusha, Hamashiach, start to use the Hebrew names because scripture was written in Hebrew, so it would only make sense that they would have Hebrew names and not these watered down English translations that are only pagan titles of Baal because as I have just shown you earlier today, the word Lord means Baal. Not only that, but we can start to see that our Messiah was actually risen on the Shabbat. He was not risen on Easter Sunday. That has nothing to do with him, but everything to do with the worship of Tammuz. So hopefully this will help you in your study and your journey into truth. I will leave the helpful links for you below. This is Truth Unveiled here saying shalom and take care.